Okay, I think we can begin now. Um, welcome to How the Brain Remembers. I'm Larry Marnett, the Dean of the School of Medicine Basic Sciences. Today, in partnership with Parnassus Books, we're pleased to host a conversation between New York Times bestselling author and neuroscientist, Lisa Genova, and Vanderbilt Brain Institute's Barlow Family Director, Lisa Monteggia, about Dr. Genova's latest book, Remember, The Science of Memory and the Art of Forgetting. Dr. Genova holds a degree in biopsychology from Bates College and a PhD in neuroscience from Harvard University. She's the New York Times bestselling author of novels, Still Alice, Left Neglected, Love Anthony, Inside the O'Briens, and Every Note Played. Julianne Moore won the Best Actress Oscar for her role in the film adaptation of Still Alice. Dr. Genova is a sought after speaker and her TED Talks on preventing Alzheimer's and how memory works have a combined total of over 6.3 million views. Dr. Genova's newest book being discussed today looks at how memories are made and how we retrieve them. If forgotten memories are erased forever, why some memories are built to exist for only a few seconds while others can last a lifetime. The distinction between normal forgetting and forgetting due to Alzheimer's and how to create better expectations for and relationship with your memory. Leading this discussion is Dr. Lisa Monteggio, director of the Vanderbilt Brain Institute and a professor of pharmacology. The Brain Institute facilitates the extensive neuroscience related endeavors carried out at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Monteggio is a thought leader in the neuroscience community about the mechanisms underlying antidepressant efficacy with implications towards depression, bipolar disorder, and suicide, as well as studying the role of the gene linked to the autism spectrum disorder, Rett syndrome. She has received numerous awards, including the Daniel X. Friedman Award from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, the Rising Star Award from the International Mental Health Research Organization, and the Daniel H. Efron Award for Outstanding Basic and Translational Research from the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology. Dr. Monteggia had recently been elected counselor for the Society for Neuroscience and currently serves as a member of the National Institute, National Institute of Health Brain Initiative Working Group that reports to the NIH director. She's a senior editor of neuroscience, neuropsychopharmacology and a member of the editorial boards of eLife, Journal of Neuroscience, Journal of Biological Chemistry, Biological Psychiatry, and Hippocampus. I'm now pleased to turn the conversation over to Drs. Monteggia and Genova. Lisa? Thank you, Dean Marnett. So as Larry said, my guest today is Dr. Lisa Genova, a best-selling author and an accomplished neuroscientist, and she's graciously agreed to participate in this virtual event hosted by Vanderbilt University, the Vanderbilt Brain Institute and Parnassus Books. So Lisa, welcome. We are delighted to have you. Ah, oh, thank you so, so much. And thank you to everyone for making this possible. So I wanted to start a little uh, about you. We're gonna be discussing your book, Remember. Uh, and really I wanted to set the stage. So why did you choose the field of neuroscience? Why was this your area of study? Okay, well, I was always a nerdy science geek. I loved science and math. And so I knew that I was interested in becoming a biologist of some sort. And I went to Bates College and my sophomore year, two things happened. I took what would now be called a course in neuroscience, but back then it was called physiological psychology. So the study of the brain and behavior. So how does this organ in our skull help us to remember and our, it's in charge of our moods and our thoughts and our desires and, and walking and, and talking and language, all of that, fascinating. And then at the same time, I also read a book called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat by Oliver Sacks, which is a collection of uh, true short stories about fascinating neurological patients. So between those two experiences, I was all in. I knew I wanted to be a neuroscientist. So um, this curiosity about the brain, after reading uh, the book and really thinking about it, what led you into research? 
Well, I think that was always my, my lens into my fascination with biology. Like how do we work? Right. So, you know, the heart's a pump, the kidneys a filter, and then here's the brain. How does it work? And it was really sort of such an exciting field to go into because it's sort of the most unknown. It's the last frontier of biology, really. Um, so it was, it just seemed like a really exciting career to try and figure out how things work. And I, like you, I spent a lot of time researching the molecular neurobiology of drug addiction. So that was really where I spent my time in lab. So as a scientist, what would you say was your biggest accomplishment in the lab? Okay, well, so I, I was at Harvard for a while in Mass General, and then I followed Steve Hyman to the National Institute of Mental Health. And there I was researching the role of uh, conditioned stimuli and their ability to elicit a biological response in rats that were addicted to cocaine or amphetamine. So it was, you know, pairing a certain environment, time of day, certain cues with the everyday injection of, say, cocaine. So that those cues now predict the, the experience of cocaine. And so what happened, like this is sort of a model of, of relapse, right? So then uh, after so many exposures, what happens then if I just give saline injection at that time of day? What happens in the brain? And it turns out that the gene expression in certain parts of the brain looked as if those rats had gotten cocaine it, it, itself. And then could we pharmacologically block that gene expression? So the, again, the idea of, of, you know, if someone goes into rehab, okay, I'm clean and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I have the, the desire not to be addicted anymore and I'm going to kick this, but then maybe I go back home and all of the conditioned stimuli are there, right? So all of the, play, the, the, the smells, the sights, the sounds of what would then be that bell like Pavlov's dog ringing the bell to salivate. It's like, oh my gosh, now it's going to trigger gene expression in my brain that might act as a primer um, to, to, um, to instigate relapse. So that was the, the work I did there. Yeah, and I think um, you know that's really important and it highlights the importance of basic research and fundamentally understanding the brain. Mm -hmm. So why yes. did you- so, Yes. Why did you transition from a career as a successful research scientist to an author? Yeah, doesn't everyone do that? <laughs> Isn't that the normal career path? Um, yeah, it was not a planned move. I um, I never really saw it coming. I my grandmother had Alzheimer's, and I was in my twenties, my late twenties, um, when she was diagnosed. She was in her eighties, and I come from a a pretty large Italian family, and so my nana had nine children, and I'm one of the youngest grandchildren. So the responsibility of caregiving did not fall on my shoulders. I was very close with my grandmother and I lived nearby and I'm a neuroscientist in this big Italian family. So I took it as my responsibility to learn as much about this disease as I could and pass that education on to primarily my aunts who were doing most of the caregiving um, and my mom and dad too. So I did all that and I read the scientific research papers first and then I read the clinical text, how is this disease managed? I read the caregiver's perspective, the 36 hour day, and I learned a lot. But what was missing for me was the perspective of the person with the disease. So at the time, those stories weren't written yet. Um, this was back in the 90s. And I was you know, 26, 27, 28, and didn't know how to really be with my grandmother. Like, so by the time we showed up, she really very quickly forgot who we all were. Um, so she didn't recognize me anymore. And she was, you know, she was, a lot of her behavior was very strange and upsetting and heartbreaking. And so I felt really bad for her. Mm -hmm. And I felt really bad for us for losing all of those reasons that we were connected. She didn't know who we were. She, she lost, she had a beautiful life and lost all of her relationship to that. Um, that's sympathy. I didn't know how to feel with her. That's empathy. And so I felt very disconnected from her and didn't know how to be with her. And I had this intuitive notion that, well, fiction is a place where you can explore empathy. 
fiction story gives you a chance to walk in someone else's shoes and so I thought well someday I'll write a story about a woman with Alzheimer's and tell it from her perspective from the very first symptoms um, and so that's where that started oh that's fascinating I mean you and I share a similar family history of you know sort of the large Italian family and trying to be sort of the person explaining the brain to the members around you but so many people on this call have personal experience with Alzheimer's disease and you put such a, you know, poignant and empathetic take in your previous book. But when you look more broadly at your work, um, you know, Alzheimer's disease, as you mentioned, it's a progressive disease that destroys memory and other important mental functions. You've, dis um, you've discussed ALS in your writings, and it's a wasting disorder that, you know, killed baseball legend Lou Gehrig. Traumatic brain injury. We know so little about it, but it's typically caused by an outside force, like a violent blow to the head. And there's no cure for these disorders. So I guess my question really is starting this discussion is, how have these previous topics of your previous writings affected your latest book, Remember? Oh, well, this book grew really out of the first one, which was still Alice, um, mm -hmm. about Alzheimer's. So. I've been using this book um, about a woman with Alzheimer's as a vehicle for conversation about this disease, which millions of people have, and yet millions of people are too afraid to talk about. Um, so this disease is still enshrouded with a lot of shame and stigma and alienation and isolation, and people just don't want to talk about it. And yet, you know, if we're going to cure this disease, we need to talk about it. If we want to feel less isolated and alienated, you know, we can humanize this disease if we talk about it. So I've been talking about Alzheimer's for over a decade um, to folks using Still Alice as that platform. And what I found was that while I was able to educate folks about Alzheimer's and we could be in that conversation, I found that the conversation always drifted to a place that was slightly different. And people thought they were asking me, do I have Alzheimer's? So people would approach me in the book signing lines or in the ladies room and almost like a confession say to me things like, I'm always walking into a room and I don't know why I'm in there. Or if I don't write everything down, I won't remember to do it later. Or I'm always forgetting people's names and my dad has Alzheimer's or they know someone in their family who might've had it. Um, or they know a friend, they, they, they were aware of Alzheimer's and they're 50, 60, 70 years old. And they're bringing to me these moments of forgetting, convinced that I'm going to diagnose them with Alzheimer's in this very conversation. And every single time I let these folks know that everything you've just told me is the price of playing poker. Like you own a human brain and these are all no, very much normal moments of forgetting. And it's not a sign of Alzheimer's, you're okay. And I'd see the relief wash over everyone. And I knew that I just sent that person on their way transformed because they won't be now chronically stressed about everyday moments of forgetting. And so it just became a point where at least I thought, I have to write this down and because one person at a time in the ladies room is not an efficient way to go about this education. And so, yeah, there's just so much misconception out there. There's so much fear and shame around memory. People have really, you know, not great relationships with their memory. And so I can help with that. And so that's what this book was for. Was there one particular moment in particular that really just blew you away when you were in a book tour or in the ladies room? where someone came up to you so incredibly stressed that really was the light bulb of, now is the time to write this. No, it wasn't one, uh, it wasn't one particular one. It, it was predictable. It was every, it was getting to the point where it was every single time. And it was a little more that I, I had to make the conscious choice to sort of stop the momentum of the, the novel writing, um, mm -hmm. which I really enjoy and say, okay, I'm gonna do something a little different now and I'm gonna write my first nonfiction book. It's time, I need to do this because again, it's the questions weren't stopping. Like this was, I, I was guaranteed that people were gonna ask me questions about 
Um, like, oh, I'm, I'm always forgetting where I, I put my phone and my glasses. Like every day I misplace my glasses. I can't remember where I put them. I'm, I must, does this mean I'm getting Alzheimer's? Yeah. No. So, neuroscience is a very broad field. Your previous mm -hmm. work was more on addiction. And now you're delving more into learning and memory. Um, and in a different way than in still Alice. So sort of very broadly, what puzzles you the most currently about memory and forgetting? Oh, that's a great question. That's a big question, Lisa. I know. <laughs> um, what do you think about the most? What puzzles? Think about uh, remembering and forgetting. Um, well, I'm fascinated by both of them. I think what fascinates me the most, I think what we understand the least is, is targeted intentional forgetting that, you know, so I think people tend to villainize forgetting. They think of memory as this war in your brain between memory, remembering the good guy and forgetting the bad guy. And we think that forgetting is just this passive thing that happens to us, unless we're like really focusing on remembering something that we're gonna forget it. And it's this terrible, tragic thing. And, and yet forgetting is really important for our ability to function and to remember. And that, that forgetting can be an active neurological process. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't understand those molecular events yet that are involved in the active process of forgetting information that's not useful to us. So I'm fascinated by that. Um, I'm also fascinated by people who have something called highly superior autobiographical memory. Mm -hmm. um, I interviewed actress Mary Lou Henner for the book Who Has This. She's one of like about 100 people in the world who've been identified. These folks remember in vivid, specific detail um, stuff that happened your episodic memory like what happened every day of their lives since about the age of 10 11 12 and the rest of us don't do that and we can talk more about that later if you want but their brains organize memory for what happened in a very different way that feels to me like a superpower because I tried to stump Mary Lou Henner and I couldn't because she would name it's personal information so sort of like dear di diary here's what happened on you know April 10th you know, 1986, but I, she'd also name, you know, oh, this is what ha was happening in the news. This is what the weather was this. I mean, she could, I could verify that she was, she was right. So that's amazing to me. That is amazing. And I wanted to follow up on that point because as you mentioned, you interviewed her and these incidents of sort of giving her dates and she could remember, but it didn't extend to all types of memory. Could you discuss that? No. Yes. So we have different kinds of memory and they're organized and treated differently by our brains. So we have the memory for the stuff, you know, this is called semantic memory. This is, these are all the facts and information you've learned. So the stuff you learned in school, your autobiographical information. So anytime you fill out a form, like where, what's your street address, what's your phone number, that's your semantic memory stuff, you know, then there's also the how to do stuff your muscle memory it doesn't live in your muscles and actually the choreography the memory for the procedures of how to do things is in your brain and your brain tells your muscles what to do so this is everything it's brushing your teeth it's typing it's just fall um, all the things you know how to do is a kind of memory and that's treated very differently than the facts and information by your brain there's another kind called episodic memory this is the memory for what happened. This is the story of your life. It's, oh, remember when, up, 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 all that stuff. And that's treated differently by your brain as well, especially with respect to retrieval. Um, so it, they, they're, just, they're very different in terms of um, how we experience them as well. So to just keep going on this, if you'd like. So <clears throat> let, let me give you an example. <clears throat> Sorry. For stuff you know, the semantic memory. So in third grade, I memorized the times tables. So, right, so we all did this at some point. Six times six is 36. No matter how many times I recall that memory, it doesn't risk changing over time. It's not gonna be six times six is 75. Like it's gonna be 36 forever. Semantic memories are stable over time. 
same with muscle memories. This is where that saying, it's just like riding a bike comes in, right? So you learn it, you learn it, you practice, practice, you learn it. It becomes an automated sequence of steps that you don't now have to think about it, the subconscious. And I can, if I learned how to ride a bike when I'm 12, long as I'm physically fit enough, I can ride the bike when I'm 80 and I don't have to relearn it. I memorized it. Good. Episodic memories are strange. So the memories for stuff that happened can change over time. Every time I retrieve a memory for something that happened, my brain has the opportunity to add something to it, subtract something from it, offer a new opinion. If someone else adds, if my brother was, I'm remembering uh, Christmas when I was 12, my brother's in the room and he remembers something that I don't, but I believe him, I might add that to my story. However, I change it now, it then gets stored back into my brain, it gets consolidated back into my brain and, and overwrites the previous version. And so you can drift further and further away from the slice of reality you actually remembered in the first place over time with, with memories for what happened. And the studies on that is fascinating as well. And kind of scary if you think about things like eyewitness testimony, mm -hmm. because that's a memory for something that happened and it can be inaccurate. It can be wildly inaccurate. So when you talk though about memories being inaccurate, you gave a great example, you know, again, of talking to people and it can sort of drift. What mm -hmm. about though um, the memory where, for example, um, I mixed up my sister-in-law's birthday. I know when it is, and yet mm -hmm. now I always want to move it two days later. So how can memories be sort of wrong? How does that process work? Oh, that's interesting. I wonder why you're doing that. It's like, if you think about it, there's something in there that you're so, so how to remember, like, so what is a memory? Let's start there. Yeah, exactly. So a memory isn't, what? I hope you're not frozen on me, Lisa. Are you there? Okay. Oh, no, I'm here. I'm here. Go right ahead. I think actually you froze on us, but yeah, no, let's talk about memory cre creation and how it happens in the brain, kind of continuing. Okay. Yeah, let's start with that because I think people don't really know this. So I think that people think that it's, you have a memory bank somewhere in your brain and everything gets filed there and it's like in a little file cabinet or it's like a DVD menu. Um, it's not. Um, people might also think that it might be like a video camera and you're recording this constant stream of everything that's happening and that's not memory. So memory is the constellation of neural activity, the pattern of neural activity that was activated when you experienced or learned something and it becomes linked in a neural circuit of connections. So if I, um, the example I use in the book is, okay, if I'm remembering the first day of summer and that memory is a bunch of friends on the beach, the kids are playing soccer, it's a beautiful sunset. Um, the lady we're drinking, the ladies are drinking white wine. There's oysters, s'mores for the kids on the bonfire. One of the kids gets stung by a jellyfish. And I remember Lady Gaga's new song playing on, on the, the speakers. So that's the memory of what happened. So the sights, the sights I'm seeing are, are, are experienced in the back of my brain, your visual cortex, your occipital lobe. The sounds, Lady Gaga's song is in my temporal lobe, my auditory cortex. The smells are in my olfactory cortex, uh, you know, the, the bonfire and the s'mores. Um, so it's the, how I felt about it all. Oh, it's summer and I'm with my best friends and it's wonderful. That's in my emotional brain. That's in my limbic system. So these neurons don't even live near each other. They're in very different neural neighborhoods, but they become connected. They become consolidated into a neural circuit that if any one of those pieces are activated, they can then reach the others and activate those. And that's experienced as a memory. So Lady Gaga has nothing to do with a jellyfish sting, which has nothing to do with s'mores but they do in my brain because they are a connected circuit that represents a memory that I still hold all these years later. So why are some memories more likely to be remembered than others? Mm -hmm. Okay, so human brains remember what is meaningful, emotional, surprising, new, and repeated. 
So, and then the inverse, is the, the converse is true. So we don't remember what is routine, ho-hum, been there, done that, same old, same old, not mm -hmm. emotional and not repeated. So, you know, if you do something over and over and over again, right, this is how we learn information a lot of times, right? With practice, 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 whether it's, you know, how to swing a golf club or play the piano or um, learning vocabulary words, right? Do it again, do it again, do it again. That helps because every time you go over those neural circuits, you are strengthening them. You are strengthening the activity and the connections of those neurons. Um, but we also care about our brains really do remember because of input from limbic system and emotional systems, um, we remember what's emotional, what's surprising, what's meaningful, what we care about. And this is in part has to do with attention as well. So the first necessary ingredient in creating a memory that's gonna last longer than this present moment is your attention. So what do we pay attention to? Whoa, that was surprising. I pay attention to that. Oh, that's so emotional. I feel either like great joy or fear or anger. Like that's probably, you know, not the same as like everyday morning coffee, right? It's not brushing my teeth that moment. That is something that might be important for my survival. Um, so it's, whoa, pay attention to that. So anytime we're paying attention to what's going on, that gives our brain a really good chance of remembering it. So, you know, obviously the idea of remembering and forgetting, they all tie into very basic processes. For example, you know, school-age learning. And we know that teachers go through a lot of uh, behavior that's reinforced. So it's more likely to occur by using repetition, but that takes time. And a lot of times students wanna take the more trial and error approach. So how do these types of approaches strengthen memories? You mentioned briefly a little bit on re uh, repetition, but just a little more in depth. Uh, or your sure. Thoughts. Yeah. So there's a lot that we can unpack there. So if I'm trying to learn for a test, um, a number of things. So if I only have, say I have eight hours to study for a test that I have next week, mm -hmm. you're better off spacing out those eight hours between now and then. Um, like, you know, and I say, like, say it's seven hours, just do an hour a day between mm -hmm. now and the test, then doing seven hours the night before the test. Um, the, We've all learned spacing that. effect. Yes, yeah, spacing effect. So all you procrastinators, like, space it out. Um, you also want to sleep on the information. So we, you're, there's a part of your brain called the hippocampus, and this is essential for creating long-term memories. And your hippocampus is what is sort of activating and repeating that pattern of neural activity, which is the information that you're trying to remember. And it does this primarily while you sleep. So if you pull an all-nighter the night before a test, you might be able to regurgitate the information that's still like, you know, sitting in your hippocampus and hasn't really become a long-term memory yet. You might be able to pull that off, but you're not going to remember it next week or next year. Um, and so if you care about that, you, you want to give your brain a chance to, to consolidate it into a long-term lasting neural circuit, a lasting, enduring memory. And that requires sleep. So you want to get a good night's sleep. Um, information, if you're just hammering it over and over again, that's tough. Um, what's easier is if we associate, if we use our brain's um, proclivity to things that it likes with respect to memory. So your brain loves anything visual, meaningful, emotional. Um, it also likes where things are in space. So um, a silly example I use, and it's highly memorable. So you just make, attach weird things to what you're trying to learn. I'll simplify here and just say, say I'm trying to remember that I need to buy milk later. Okay. So that's, our brains are terrible at remembering to do things later. We can talk about that as well. Um, <laughs> And so writing things down is good practice. People think, oh, if I write down what I need to do later, I'm cheating and my brain is weak and my memory is terrible. No, pilots use checklists instead of their brains to remember to lower the wheels of the plane before landing. Like that's the best example I can come up with. Like do not use your brain to remember to do stuff later. If you can help it, write it down. But say I don't have a pen, I don't have paper, I don't have my phone. I got to buy milk. So in the moment I can 
attach a visual image to milk. Like, oh, I'm going to picture Dwayne the Rock Johnson milking a cow. And I'm not going to just picture him milking a cow. I'm going to put him somewhere. So I'm going to put the cow on my kitchen table and Dwayne the Rock Johnson's milking that cow. I've even pictured like Tina Fey on the kitchen table, like, like lying on the kitchen table and he's squirting it, like he's squirting it on her. Um, so it's, it's make it grotesque, bizarre, silly, make the image memorable, right? Have it evoke some emotion in you, like makes you laugh, makes you cringe, something, um, and put it somewhere. So if you can put it in a room in your house, someplace that you know well, um, your brain will, will love that information. So it's, it helps, it helps to um, make a story out of stuff that you're trying to learn. So if you're just trying to learn a bunch of words, a bunch of words is hard, but a bunch of words in a sentence is easy, right? So um, it, create a story around what you're trying to learn will help you as well. No, that's wonderful advice, wonderful advice. So I know one question that many people on the call are interested in, and I'm sure you get this question a lot, but what is the distinction between normal forgetting and forgetting due to Alzheimer's? Yeah, this is like the million dollar question. And, and so there are a lot of distinctions and it's actually very clear. It's not, not very confusing. So, okay, let's go over the, where did I put my, so where did I put my phone, my glasses, my keys, where did I park my car? right? So people do this all the time. And they think if you know, if you're over 40, you think, uh Oh, so I will bet all the money I'm making on this book. <laughs> I'll bet everything that 99% of the time for 99% of us, when you can't find your glasses, it's because you didn't pay attention to where you put them in the first place. So again, it's the first necessary ingredient in creating a memory for, for that's going to last longer than this 30 seconds is attention. If I don't add my attention to like, I'm placing my glasses on this kitchen table before I buzz off doing the next 20 things, or maybe I'm already texting and I'm thinking of whatever. If I don't give that moment's attention to where I put them, my memory system doesn't even get involved. I've never created a memory of where I put those glasses in the first place. So when I'm crazed looking for them, 10 minutes later, where did I put my glasses? I can't find them. Oh my God, what's wrong with my memory? Nothing's wrong with my memory. I didn't involve my memory. I haven't forgotten anything. That's a symptom of distraction, right? So I didn't pay attention to where I put them. So like, like so, and I love this example because people will do this and it really brings home how the brain works with respect to memory. Have you ever driven somewhere you're driving. For me, it's like I cross over the Sagamore Bridge from Boston to Cape Cod a lot. It's a big bridge, four lanes, giant structure. You can't miss it. My eyes are open while I drive over the bridge. I'm not swerving. I'm not doing it. I'm doing, I'm driving properly. And then 10 minutes after I've crossed that bridge, I will regularly wonder, wait, where am I? Did I already go over the bridge? Right. So have you done this? You're driving somewhere familiar. So it's not new. It's not surprising. It's not emotional. All the landmarks are same old, same old. And you're driving and suddenly you have a moment. You're like, I don't remember any of this trip. I don't remember the last 10 minutes of this ride. Right. So it's your brain, your eyes were open. Your brain saw it, but you never put it into memory because you weren't paying attention to the details of what your brain was seeing. So that's normal. What's not normal is, so like what's normal is uh, I park my car and I'm in a, a parking garage and I, I hop into the mall, I shop for a couple of hours and then I come out and I think, oh my God, I don't remember where I parked. Mm -hmm. Am I level three or level four? Oh, I don't know, wasn't paying attention. What's Alzheimer's or what could be a sign of dementia or something, and it's not always Alzheimer's, it could be a B12 deficiency, it could be chronic sleep deprivation, it could be a lot of things, it could be depression. Um, but what's not normal is you get out of that shopping mall and you think, I don't remember how I got here. Or you're standing in front of your car and you don't recognize it as yours. Um, that's not normal. If you're looking for your keys and you can't find them, um, and then you eventually find them and you think, wait, what are these for? That's not normal forgetting. Um, so the distinction is very different from, oh, it was level three, not level four. Oh, like the keys are on the kitchen table. Yeah, that 
I just, I threw them there when I went to go to the bathroom and I wasn't paying attention to where I threw them. Um, words that go missing. This is a big one for people. Um, so it's called, often called tip of the tongue. Like, oh, what's his name? Oh, the actor in that movie. Oh, oh, I can see his face. I, what's his name? Begins with J. Ah, right. Or, oh, my friend recommended a movie on Netflix to watch. What's the name of it? So we do that all the time and it's normal. Um, so tip of the tongue, especially we call it blocking, blocking on a proper noun in particular. So person's name, a city, a movie title, book title, title, super normal. You can picture these proper nouns as living in neurological cul-de-sacs. They have associations, but eventually there's really one way into that house at the end of the street. And there's no other way to get there. And so it's like, can be hard to produce it. Um, we also often come up with loosely related words along the way that take us to a completely different neural neighborhood by accident. So you're getting close, but then like, oh, it's actually related to this other loosely related or loosely, it sounds like the word, but it's not the word. Now it's even harder and you feel the pain and you're, it's because you're in the wrong place in your brain. And if you relax and stop thinking about it, you can stop perseverating on the wrong name in the wrong neighborhood. And maybe eventually it pops into consciousness. Again, that's normal. What's not normal is if words go missing dozens of times a day. So experiencing a tip of the tongue, like young people, so the college students probably experience three to four a week and they don't sweat them because they're young. Um, they also look them up and that's good. It's fine to do this. So Googling the names that go missing, mm -hmm. totally okay. You're not weak. Like, so again, people think they're cheating or they're weakening their memory if they do that. This is a normal glitch in memory retrieval. You're not going to get any smarter by just suffering through it. Um, but for Alzheimer's, it's more um, common words are going to go missing. So I'll think, you know, what the, the, the word for the thing I write with, what's that, what, the thing I write with? Can I have a, um, a thing for, you know, you fill it with water to, to drink it, like a glass. So if that, if those words start going missing a lot during the day, um, that could be something. Another first sign of Alzheimer's, the disease tends to start in the hippocampus which is the part of the brain you need to form new memories. So if I'm repeating myself a lot, because I don't remember that I told you this five minutes ago, if I can't remember what you said 10 minutes ago, if I can't remember what I ate for lunch today, if recent memories um, become elusive to me, that could be a sign that something's wrong in my hippocampus and that's not, that's not normal forgetting. So I think you've just reassured a lot of people on this call. Of so. normal processes of things of being an autopilot or tip of the tongue, that these are normal processes. So what can we do to strengthen our memory processes? Okay, so aside from, you know, the, some of the stuff we talked about with respect to visual imagery and making it emotional, making it meaningful, um, get out of your routine. So we don't remember, if you want to remember what happens in your life, Think about how, and this has been so much worse with the pandemic, right? So our lives have, over the past year, shrunk down to the confines of our homes and the same people, <laughs> your family every day. And, you know, we used to go to concerts and theater and travel to new cities and <sighs> we've all been home. And so the menu of possible experiences is like dwindled. And when that happens, we don't, I tell everyone, this is the most memorable year that we won't remember because we don't remember same old, same old. So for example, can you all remember everyone you texted and everyone who texted you three days ago? Um, tell me the details of your morning shower last Friday, right? Tell me the, uh, what you had for lunch last Thursday, right? Like Tuesday is Saturday, like we don't know. It's like every day is blended into the same right now. So it's really tough. Um, but we don't remember these, these ho-hum, inconsequential, not so meaningful day-to-day -day stuff. Um, so if you wanna remember more, like instead of just walking in your neighborhood, um, if you go for a walk every day, walk somewhere new, walk in a different neighborhood, experience something new, invite newness, cook a new recipe, um, try, to, try to find some newness. This is why we remember our vacations so much, right? Because we've gone to a new place new architecture, different food, everything's new and surprising and different and we rem and it's meaningful to you, so you remember it. Um, but in terms of brain health, what can we do to support 
our our memory and sort of mm -hmm. optimizing our ability to even remember anything we want. One of the number one things I've already touched on is sleep. So the sleep science is super clear. We of sleep a night for your overall health, your brain health, and your memory. So three things are happening with respect to memory while you sleep that I can share that I think are really important take homes. Um, I think a lot of people think that sleep is just this time where we're not doing anything, right? We're just dormant and unconscious and what a waste of time. But we're very biologically busy while we sleep. So what's going on in your brain? So while you sleep, I already alluded to this, your hippocampus is binding your memories together. It's stitching together all of those disparate neurons that, that represent all of the sights and sounds and smells and, and feelings of what you learned and experienced today into a lasting changes in neural architecture, which result in lasting, enduring memories. So that's happening while you sleep. So if you don't get a full night's sleep, your hippocampus might not have had enough time to do its job. And then you'll wake up the next day with memories from yesterday, not fully formed, or maybe not formed at all. You'll forget some of yesterday that you had intended to remember. Um, second thing, if I don't get enough sleep tonight, if I'm really sleep deprived, my frontal lobe is gonna be dragging itself to its day job today. And one of its most important jobs is paying attention. So, right, and we've all experienced this, like, oh, I'm so tired, I'm sorry, what did you just say? So if I can't pay attention to you and what's going on today, what am I not gonna be able to do well today? Make new memories. So a bad night's sleep last night means I won't have consolidated yesterday's information and experiences well enough. I won't be able to uh, take in the real slices of reality I want to today to make new memories from today. I'm almost experiencing a form of amnesia today. Mm -hmm. The third thing that's happening while you sleep, which is super important, is with respect to Alzheimer's. So while we sleep, our glial cells in our brains, you can picture these guys as like little janitors. This is the sewage and sanitation department of your brain. These glial cells are clearing away the metabolic debris that accumulated in your synapses <clears throat> while you're in the business of being awake. And one of the things that clears away, crucially, is a protein called amyloid beta. Now, amyloid beta, if it's not cleared away, it's a sticky protein and it will bind to itself and it will form what we call amyloid plaques. And enough, if enough of these plaques accumulate and if they reach a tipping point, that's the beginning of Alzheimer's. So it doesn't happen overnight, this accumulation reaching that tipping point. We think it takes 15 to 20 years. And so the good news is we can affect this through lots of things, and one of them is sleep. So if you get a, every every night, so forget about what you haven't done already. The years of sleep deprivation, especially for women, I think you know who are pregnant and then have babies and the breastfeeding or the nurse up all night, and then it's perimenopause, and menopause, and so women in particular are like, oh my god, I haven't slept well in decades. Every night, like water under the bridge. If you don't have Alzheimer's today, what can you do tonight to protect yourself from Alzheimer's? So there's a lot, that, and this is a whole other discussion, but there is a lot that you can do to stack the deck in your favor to get a better night's sleep. So um, just, I'll give you one right now, and then the rest you can Google because there's a lot there. But don't give up. If you're not getting good sleep, there's a lot that you can, there are a lot of tools and it's not sleeping pills. Those are not, that's not the answer. Um, but let's talk about caffeine for a sec. So caffeine is actually really good for your memory. It help, it caffeine improves your attention. And so if I, by, by boosting my ability to attend, I am, I can make memories today. But you want to be careful of when your last dose of caffeine is for the day. So uh, the half-life of caffeine is about five hours. We all metabolize a little differently. But say, which means that half the amount of caffeine in your mocha frappuccino is still buzzing around in your brain and body five hours later. So if I have a cappuccino at seven at night after dinner, then there are about 32 milligrams of caffeine are still in my brain at midnight, interfering with a neuromodulator called adenosine, which is supposed to be able to help me fall asleep, but caffeine is countering that. So you just want to be careful um, when you have your last 
you know, coffee or tea of the day. Um, what else helps your memory? Exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that exercise is really good for your memory today and for reducing your risk of Alzheimer's tomorrow. The studies are really fascinating with respect to Alzheimer's. We think that a, even a brisk walk, which means like walking like you're in a hurry, um, four times a week, five times a week can reduce your risk of Alzheimer's anywhere from a third to a half. That's a lot, right? So if you want to preserve your memory, um, if I get, said, hey, I have a pill that can reduce your risk of Alzheimer's by 50%, you'd take it. So it's exercise. It's get up and move. Get up and move. We're so sedentary. People who have an increased risk of Alzheimer's, say I have a copy of APOE4, which is a, a, a gene variant that increases your risk of Alzheimer's. Say I have a copy from mom and dad. That's significantly increasing my risk of Alzheimer's. If I had a brain scan and I'm 60 years old, my hippocampus actually might be shrunken um, unless I exercise. If I'm sedentary, it'll be shrunken. If I exercise, even with that increased risk, my hippocampus will look, look totally normal. Um, stress is bad. Chronic stress is bad for memory. Um, a little bit of stress is good for memory and we feel this, right? So with respect to whether it's execution of muscle memory, so if I want to hit a baseball, I have to have a certain amount of activation. Stress can also think of stress as like alertness, arousal, like waking up your brain. Um, if I have a test, if I have a Zoom presentation, if I have something to do, I want a certain amount of, of alertness and readiness to perform. Um, too much and I'll, and I'll choke. Right. So it's like, oh, I can't retrieve anything I know because I'm overwhelmed with stress. That's acute stress. It's meant to be a quick on, quick off process. What happens if it's chronic, which a lot of us have been experiencing this past year? So chronic stress does some a lot of bad things in our bodies, but one of the things it does is it sort of breaks this feedback loop. So normally something stressful is happening. There's a crisis, an emergency, a threat, something dangerous, something important. And your brain, um, releases hormones that release adrenaline and cortisol, the two workhorse stress hormones. And then cortisol activates receptors in your brain that shuts it off. So I, I react, I fight, I flee, I do the thing, and then, and then everything calms back down. Well, with chronic stress, the feedback loop can break. Either the receptors are down-regulated or desensitized. They don't, they don't react to cortisol anymore. And so your brain just, everything just keeps, getting activated, you keep dumping adrenaline and cortisol in your body. So you're in a constant state of fight or flight. And when this happens, this is really bad for memory. So this can shrink your hippocampus. This can make it hard for you to create new memories. This can make it hard for you to retrieve what you already know. And it increases your risk of Alzheimer's in the future. Um, and so what are we, what, what's our stress today? What are we chronically stressed about? Well, the top three major psychological stressors are uncertainty, lack of perceived control, social isolation. So you've described the year 2020. Pandemic. Check, check, check. Uh, a lot. The question was, what, you know, what do we do to help our memory? So this is where I think people know, like people are telling us to meditate and do yoga and practices and mindful and exercise actually works here too. Um, so those things, the reason people are telling us that exercise, yoga, and meditation are good for us is one of the things is that it's, it's a, a mighty warrior against the a being in the face of st chronic stress. So you know, I can't get rid of the pandemic. I can't get rid of the political divide, climate change, all the stuff. The, the world we're in is stressful. But what can we do to put the brakes on that stress response? And so we know that, that like practices in meditation will actually restore the size of your hippocampus. It will increase neurogenesis in your hippocampus, the birth of new neurons. You can make new neurons there, which is super handy um, in the face of chronic stress. Um, and so I wanna give folks a quick exercise on this because I also have found that people start tuning me out when I say, oh, meditation is really helpful for your memory and for reducing your risk of Alzheimer's. I think a lot of folks think that like, oh, I have to go to a retreat to learn how to do it. Like I have to you know, go to Nepal or I don't have time to do a 30 minute meditation or I don't know how to do it. I, I won't, I'll fail. There's all these excuses. 
Let me give you one quick one, folks, because this you can actually use anytime. It's nine second meditation. So if you can, if you're in a place where you can close your eyes, do so, but you don't have to. So if you close your eyes, breathe in through your nose to the count of four, hold it for a second, and then breathe out through your nose to the count of four. And notice how you feel. Because here's the deal. If you're in a state of stress, if you're in a state of fight or flight, you are not breathing calmly through your nose. You're breathing like this, <laughs> right? And your physiology is reacting in kind. We can flip it around. So what by breathing in and out slowly through your nose, you're informing your physiology. You're informing your brain and your body that you are safe. And then the, the, the molecular cascades can react in kind. So we can put the brakes on that chronic stress response by just telling our, our brain, no, 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 you're okay. Um, so sleep, reducing stress, exercise, those are gonna keep your brain healthy. Um, keep your memory healthy for a really long time. No, and that is wonderful advice, wonderful advice. I wanted to switch over because we only have a few minutes and we were so incredibly fortunate to have people register for this event that submitted questions. Okay. And we received a tremendous number of questions. We're only gonna probably be able to get to a couple of them, but I, uh, these, are off, these are questions that were submitted and a number of them focused, uh, again, sort of, coming back to this idea of aging and memory and forget. We hear about, um, you know, you don't make as many memories per se as you age. People have said that that's been in culture, in the popular culture at least. But what about forgetting with aging and normal aging processes? Why does that yeah. happen? So I, it is not, I think let's bust the first myth that you don't make as memories as, as many memories as you get older. Right. That's not true. It's only true if you decide to retire and sit on your couch and, and not learn new things anymore. Exactly. So the importance that the brain is a muscle. Yeah, you know, every time you're learning something new, you're building new synaptic connections. You're building a, a bigger brain. Um, you're creating more opportunities for memory. Um, so you can, you can continue to learn new things and create new memories for all kinds. The, semantic, episodic, and muscle throughout life. So you, you know, 80 year olds can, you know, learn to juggle or a new language. Like you, there's, there's no limit to what you can remember. Um, and I, the example I use in the book is Akira Haraguchi, a retired 69 year old engineer from Japan decided he wanted to memorize pi out to as many numbers as he could. And he holds the world record, it's like 111,000 digits of pi at the age of 69. So, I mean, there's no limit there. Um, forgetting does happen with aging. And I wanted to be real about this with folks because I think that we also live in a, in a world and a culture that reveres youth and doesn't ever wanna die and doesn't ever wanna age in any way. And your memory does age and we can, we can help it be the best that it can be, but your 70 year old memory is probably not gonna be as sharp as your 30 year old memory. Mm -hmm. um, just, like the, just like the skin on your face, people, <laughs> like the, your body ages. Um, so how does it age? It's the biggest thing, the, the, the biggest impact I, I've found is that it's processing speed slows. And this affects a lot of things and we feel this. It's as you age, it's, oh, I know it. Hold on a second. It's coming. Like it's the, like, so the ability to, to, to get information, to recall information quickly um, slows down as we age. Our ability to pay attention to more than one thing at a time diminishes with age. So our ability to, to attend to multiple um, sensory information. So to, to pick up the sight, sound, smells, feels, all of that. Um, is less as we age. So we might miss some things. Um, we still can recall what happened as accurately and inaccurately as our younger counterparts. Um, we have wisdom as we age. This is what, you know, we have the, the, the accumulated knowledge, the semantic memories, the stuff you remember can now be, you know, we can now sort of integrate that with the 
stuff that happened, the stuff we've learned. Um, and, and so we know more as we age than we did when we were younger, truly. So it's not all bad, um, but you will have, like, that's why the words get harder to, to grab to because it's processing speed slows. And so you're like, oh, hold on. What's like, I got the word, it's coming, <laughs> so bear with me. But for the most part, um, it, it's, it, there's, there's a misnomer that, that you're going to lose your memories as you age. That is not, that's not what happens, especially if you continue to use your brain and stay healthy. If you are, you know, not living a, a brain healthy life. So if you have all the risk factors for heart disease, so you're eating a, you know, a, a diet and saturated fats and, you know, a lot of uh, processed foods, um, you're terrible, you're not getting good sleep. Um, if you're stressed and not doing anything about it, you're just totally sedentary. That's going to accumulate. Your memory will get worse over accumul accumulated decades. Um, if you take care of your brain, it will stay younger and you'll be sharp as a tack. No, and I think, I think what's really important uh, is that, again, de debunking this idea, which I sort of presented to you about, you know, you don't learn with age, you do and how, how there are normal aging processes, but importantly, what we can do about them. And so one question that often people ask is what about vitamin supplements? Can they improve your memory? Yes and no. If you're, if you're vitamin, if, they're, if you're de deficient in some, you will start to experience memory problems. And so you wanna bring those back up to what's normal. But like, so for example, if I'm B12 deficient, I will start to experience symptoms of dementia and dementia means an impairment in memory, language, or cognition out of normal for my age and education level. So I'll start to have some memory problems if I have a B12 deficiency. Well, that's great news is that we can resolve that with B12 supplements or B12 shot, but it doesn't mean that like if my memory is, no, if I'm not B12 deficient, taking more of it doesn't make my doesn't give me memory superpowers. Um, we also know vitamin E is important. Um, but you know, beyond that, it's like the Mediterranean diet supports brain health and good memory. Um, mm -hmm. So this is like the fatty fishes, like salmon, nuts, beans, all eat the rainbow. So all the colorful, brightly colored fruits and vegetables. Um, but no, there's no like you know, it's not like if I take ginkgo, no, like we did those studies and it's, it's not, um, there, there's no improvement over not taking ginkgo. Ginkgo doesn't help your memory. Um, so there's no, there's no magic pill here. It, it's more, it's kind of not very sexy, but it's the move around, eat whole foods, um, brightly colored whole foods, get a good night's sleep. Don't worry about it. <laughs> All the things we hear about. So we're going to yeah. come up on the hour and we're going to close, but I wanted to, uh, before we close, I wanted to ask one last question, just a very short of couple cents. What, um, what is the most important takeaway that you would like the readers of your book to really get as they come into this and concern about memory and aging after they close the final chapter? Mm. I want, I love this. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I want people to feel empowered and like they have an influence over their memory and their brain health. So I think that a lot of us are only comfortable with the notion that we have an influence over our health from the neck down. So we're like involved in our heart health and ladies will go to the doctor for our lady parts. And, mm -hmm. but we don't have, it's not really in the culture yet that we have control over our brain health and we have a, an, we can be very actively involved in, in the health of our memory. So I want folks to know that we can have an impact on our, our brain health. I also want people to know that your memory is not perfect. It's not designed to remember everything. And so some things it's just, it sucks at. So it's not gonna remember to call your mom later or to pick up the dry cleaning or to do stuff later, write it down. Um, so we can help it, right? So we wear glasses if your eyes need help seeing. In what ways is our memory imperfect by design? And so we can externalize that. I can Google the names. I can write down the lists. I can supply it with emotional, weird visual imagery and put it in a place. Um, so just know that where human memory is sort of fallible or inaccurate or not so great, I don't have to lay that blame on me. It's not, 
I'm not to blame. I don't have to feel shame. I don't have to feel stressed and fearful if I forget someone's name. You can say, oh, I own a human brain. Of course I forgot the name. That's okay. Yeah. So to know what I'm, what I'm supposed to remember and then let go of what you're not. That's wonderful, wonderful advice. So I want to thank again, our wonderful author, Zoom event um, participant, Dr. Lisa Genova. She was gracious enough to really educate us about learning and memory and share her words of wisdom about as we age, as people concerned about forgetting really what are normal processes. So thank you so much for your time. I'd also like to thank the Vanderbilt Brain Institute, Vanderbilt University and Vanderbilt University, the School of Medicine, Basic Science, as well as Parnassus Books for co-hosting this event. And um, the book is Remember by Lisa Genova. So please go check it out, buy a copy at Parnassus Books or one of your other local bookstores. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, such a pleasure. Thank you.